it is. You can see it tonight. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. I figured you probably can guess because we're going to be in the book of Mark. Uh, considering that's where your summer series is coming from. Now, I've, got, I've noticed something. I've noticed a trend here. I think this is my third year in a row being a part of your summer series. And every time, Dean's not here. <laughs> what's up with that, Dean? I hope you're watching this later and you answer my question, man. What's, what's going on? Uh, so, uh, I appreciate the invitation. I'll bring you. Uh, greetings from the Charlotte Avenue congregation, our ownership, and each of our members. Uh, Gastonia is a, a special place in our hearts, as I hope that you, uh, we are to you, and that you keep us in, in your prayers and know that we are giving you and your congregation and your efforts here in this community uh, in our prayers, as we mentioned, all of our sister congregations are around our area. Uh, I also bring you greetings from my family. Uh, my three-year-old brought you greetings a little earlier. It was a little bit of a sleepy scream. Uh, I blame it on your 5 o'clock service, though. I mean, she needed an hour longer nap, so, you know, that's, that is what it is. Uh, but she's back there and, and relaxing. Our, we have a, a three-month-old, Benjamin, uh, who is here with us uh, this year as well. Of course, my wife, Lena, and they all greet you, and hopefully you'll get a chance to, to see them a little bit later, and it may be probably be a little bit better mood. Uh, Mark chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 6 is what we're going to talk about, and, and we'll get there in, in just a few minutes. We may even start there, but I think this is a lesson that uh, Dean told me that it's, it's practical lessons from, from the book of Mark. And I, I read Mark chapter uh, 3, verses 1 through 6, and for a little bit I, I struggled, well, what's the, what's the practical lesson here? You know, this is the, the story, the narrative of Jesus, the, the gospel of Jesus is telling us what the, the account of Jesus is life. And in Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, we'll see what happens there shortly. But uh, it, it took me a little bit to, to dig in. And maybe it was just the, the preacher in me or, or the Bible student in me, as, as it would be in you, uh, to look past just the, the obvious. Uh, there, there's obvious practical lessons in Mark 3, 1 through 6, but maybe I was just looking for, for something a little more. So this would be for, for younger Christians, a good reminder. This will be for those of you, of you who have been Christians for a, a few years or a, a few decades maybe, and, and those of you who have been Christians for even longer. You've been Christians for a long time. This is, a, I think, a, a pretty uh, basic understanding lesson, practical application, but if the young Christian doesn't do what we're going to learn about tonight, then the young Christian is wrong. If a Christian who's been a Christian for five, ten years doesn't do this, then that Christian is wrong. If the Christian who's been a Christian for decades and decades doesn't do what we're going to talk about tonight, then that Christian is wrong. So this is a lesson that is simple. I think it's easy to understand, maybe much more difficult to put into practice. And we look at Jesus as he does this, and we appreciate the fact that he did the hard things. He did the simple things, even when it was hard to do that. Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Let's start there, and then we're going to actually back up and kind of set the context. He entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was with him. They were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. He said to the man who was with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. He said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, greed, and the hardness of their heart, he said to them, just said, said, said to the man, excuse me, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Protians against him as to how they might destroy him. You look at those verses, and I think that the simple lesson, the title of my lesson, that the application for you and I today is do good. I think that's that's the application that I get from these verses. Maybe you are a, a far more astute Bible student than I am. That's certainly possible. Uh, and, and then you can get some, some more deeper theological meaning of this, but I think the most important lesson is to do good. Let's go back a little bit. And I don't know what your, your other two previous lessons in, in the summer series have covered. I may uh, bump up against those a little bit. Maybe be a good reminder for you if they come from the uh, Mark chapter 1 uh, or, or another part of Mark chapter 2. Um, but let's, let's just look at this. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. I'm going to walk through this. I'll make, make reference. I'll read a few passages. But Mark starts not necessarily so much with the, uh, the birth of, of Jesus or those types of things. He skips right to the, the baptism of Jesus. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 9, John meets John, or Jesus meets John the Baptist and is baptized. In Mark 1, 14, he begins to preach and to heal the sick. In Mark 1, verse 22, he preaches not only does he preach, but he preaches with authority. And, and the people know this, this. He's not preaching as our scribes. He's not preaching as those who, who read the Bible or copy the Bible. He's He's preaching as if these were his own words. These were his, his own power, his own authority. In Mark 1, 25, he, he cast out a demon. And notice the people's reaction, verses 27 and 28. Mark 1, 27 28. They were all amazed. Well, of course.
course they were. He just cast out a He's been healing people. Of course they were amazed. But not just amazed. So they began to debate among themselves. There's some, some arguments, some back and forth here. And this is the question they're asking. What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits. And they obeyed him. And notice this in Mark 1.28. Immediately. The news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding districts of Galilee. So Jesus has been baptized. He's began to preach. People have noticed he's preaching with authority. He's been healing people. Now he casts out a demon. And that seems to be a trigger, uh, a big point. They say, what is this? Not only is he teaching, not only is he teaching with authority, not only is he healing people, but he's even casting out demons. And there begins to be this debate, maybe this argument, some saying uh, that Jesus must be something special. Perhaps other people saying, no, he's just a, another faith that's coming through. We know throughout history there were those who, who came to the Jewish people claiming to be the Messiah. And, and all of them saying Jesus were proven to be wrong. But the news about him spreads everywhere in the district of Galilee. All around the Sea of Galilee, all around that area, people now have heard about Jesus. In Mark 1, 29, the, the story goes on. Jesus keeps living. Uh, he goes there in Mark 1, 29, and he heals Simon Peter's wife, Simon Peter's mother, excuse me, who we would know as the Apostle Peter. He heals his mother. Uh, that evening, after he's cast out the demon, he goes to Simon Peter's house. His mother is sick. He, he heals her. She fixes them a meal. And that evening, it seems like everyone in Capernaum, which is there in Galilee, brings their sick and their demon possessed to Jesus to be healed. So he's there in, in Peter's house, basically, the, the house of, of Peter's mom, at least. Uh, and, and they hear about it. They know that he's there. And everyone in the whole town brings their sick, brings their demon possessed to Jesus. And Jesus begins to heal them. Uh, in, in the midst of this, maybe maybe before everyone's healed, before the, the line is, is, is gone completely, or maybe he waits and, and heals everyone. But we notice after this that Jesus goes off to a secluded place. And why does he do that? Well, he does that to pray. We, we see that oftentimes uh, in Jesus' life, that he sometimes uh, secludes himself to, to take a, a few moments to pray. In Mark 1, verse 36 and 37, notice what happens after he, he, he's gone away. It seems almost as if he, he's he snuck away even from Simon Peter. It says, Simon and his companions searched for him, and they found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. So here we see Jesus' popularity. This, this might be as far as the time when, when most people have very little negative to say about him. This might be the time in Jesus' life where he is the most popular. Now Jesus' popularity grows with the, the more miracles that he does, the more teaching that he does, but he becomes a, a polarizing figure. And really, our, our topic tonight in Mark chapter 3 is, is perhaps the beginning of the polarizing side. Either you really like Jesus or you really don't like Jesus. At this point in Mark chapter 1, it just seems like everybody likes him. Everyone's looking for you, Jesus. Everyone wants to see you. Uh, and he says to Simon and, and those others that are following him, he says, Let, let's go somewhere else. I need to go and continue to preach. I need to, to get out of Capernaum, and we need to keep going around and preaching. In Mark 1, 39, he travels throughout Galilee, preaching and casting out demons and healing. Uh, he, he heals one man, and he tells that man, listen, don't, don't tell anybody. Uh, and what does the man do? He goes and he tells everybody. Uh, and because of that, the scripture tells us that he can't enter a city any longer. Uh, because the, the crowds were too great, and he would enter into a city. And as soon as people heard that he was there, Jesus is here, and everyone would stop whatever they were doing, and they would come to him. And that, while Jesus certainly is calling people to him, that prevents him from, from, from preaching, perhaps. They're probably bringing the sick to him. He's not able to do everything that he would have to do. So he can't enter a city any longer. So he stays out in the wilderness, or he stays out in the, uh, the deserted place, a place that's unpopulated. And people are now coming to him, much like they had been coming to John the Baptist in the wilderness some time. Uh, in Mark chapter 2 verse 5, here's, here's another one of those polarizing moments. Uh, you know the story. Jesus is in a home. He's healing people. Uh, the man is, is paralyzed. He has four friends. You know what happens, right? Uh, the four friends can't get to him because he's, he's on a mat. They're carrying him along and, and the line is so long and they just, they just can't enter into the house. So what do they do? They climb up to the top of the house and they uh, tear off a portion of the roof and they let him down through it. Right? What, what's the first thing that Jesus does? He doesn't heal him first, right? He forgives his sins first. And, and those who are there, the, uh, the scribes, the Pharisees, perhaps others, they, they claim that's blasphemy. They call it blasphemy. It's Mark chapter 2, verse, verse 5 and following. Um, and what does Jesus do then? He asks the question, well, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? And he, he heals him, beginning to, to say, not only do I have this power to, to heal,
heal. Not only do I have this power to cast out demons, but, but I have much greater power. I have the power to, to forgive sins. And that's the, the point that he's making here. After he does that, he's already... So that, that's the, the beginning. Things are beginning to turn. People are saying, well, that's blasphemous. And if, if you and I saw someone do that today, we would say that's blasphemous, right? So if I, if I came to you and without you obeying the gospel plan of salvation, I say, well, if I, in my name and by my, tower, my, my power I forgive your sins, then you would rightly call me blasphemous. Well, we, we can see, we can understand why perhaps people who uh, weren't willing to, to look at Jesus as the Messiah yet, they might claim that his words of healing someone were blasphemous. We can, we can understand that a little bit. He goes and eats with Levi. Levi is who we would call Matthew. Matthew is a tax collector, and remember, tax collectors are, are hated uh, in the Jewish community. Tax collectors are those Jews who have began to work for the Roman officials. The Romans are the, the occupying force in, in Israel. Uh, and not only uh, is he a tax collector, hope none of you work for the IRS, but nobody likes a tax man, right? Nobody enjoys paying taxes, okay? So nobody likes Matthew in that way. And not only that, but he's also someone who in some ways has betrayed uh, his Jewish brethren by working for men, what they would say is, is the enemy. So he, Matthew, Jesus goes and eats at Matthew's table uh, in Mark chapter 2, verse 15 and following. Those who see it say and ask, why is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? Why is he doing such a thing? Again, starting to, to not quite realize the reason that Jesus is coming. Uh, Jesus in that passage says, well, it's, it's, not the, it's not those who are well who need a physician, it's the sick who need a physician. He reminds them about why he's here. Uh, and then finally, as we almost are back to where we want to be, uh, in Mark 2, 18, uh, he doesn't fast. Jesus doesn't fast. He doesn't ask his followers to fast. fast. Uh, and even, even John the Baptist's disciples, they fast. And they say, why aren't, why aren't your disciples fasting? Uh, the Pharisees fast. And they say, why aren't your disciples fasting? Well, why aren't you doing... Here's what I think really is going on. And what we have to be careful of, this is not one of the practical lessons I want to bring up, but something we need to be careful about. They ask him, why are you doing what we do? Why are you doing things the way we do things? And because he's doing something different, not wrong, but different, uh, they begin to have doubts about him. They begin to question him, perhaps even they begin to look at him negatively. And that leads us just about to where we're at. At the beginning of, uh, of Mark, or the end of Mark chapter 2, um, Jesus and his disciples are walking through a field, walking through a field of grain on the Sabbath. Some of the Jesus' disciples pick the heads of grain as they're just walking through the, the field. You can imagine you've seen a, grain, uh, a field of grain before. Uh, they're walking through that. They pick it. They rub it together in their hands to, to clean it off a little bit. They pop it in their mouths. And, and they're eating. Uh, they're, they're supplying themselves. And this is on a, a Sabbath. Uh, and the Pharisees seem to be walking along beside or keeping an eye on Jesus and his disciples. And they say that Jesus' disciples have brought, have broke the law of the Sabbath, that there should be no work on the Sabbath. And they are so strict, they consider plucking a handful of grain, rubbing it together with your fingers, and throwing it in your mouth, preparing food. You weren't supposed to prepare food on the Sabbath day. You were supposed to prepare it day ahead of time so that you can eat on the Sabbath. So they are, are so extreme in their legalism. That they say, just picking up heads of grain, rubbing it together, popping it in your mouth, that's working on the Sabbath day. Jesus tells them in Mark 2, 27, this is important for us because Mark chapter 3 is on the Sabbath day. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Pharisees and others had become uh, so legalistic, they were allowing this this rule, this law that was meant to help them, to help them remember God, remember God's great works, and also to provide them an opportunity to, to rest uh, from their work as, as God rested from His work. They had allowed that to rule over them instead of allowing Him to remind them of the great work of God. Uh, and perhaps there's, there's a lesson in that as well for us. And that's what brings us to Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Let's notice First of all, Jesus enters as, you remember, he's just in Mark chapter 2, they were walking through the field of grain, they were going on the Sabbath day to the synagogue, to their local temple, you might say, and Jesus enters the synagogue, and they're watching him, and they're watching him to accuse him. Notice that again, he entered again to the synagogue, and a man who was there, whose hand was with him, they were watching him. Now, everybody was probably watching him. Everybody who was there when, when Jesus entered the synagogue, they they're probably whispering, and they're probably nudging. Jesus, he's here. We're going to get to hear a lesson from him. How, how great is this? 
but they, they weren't just looking at him. They weren't just paying attention to him. They were watching him. Why? Watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Why? So that they might accuse him. It reminds me of Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Dear brethren, if anyone among you is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Practical lesson number one from Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. There's a big difference between catching someone in sin versus someone being caught in sin. These Pharisees, and sometimes perhaps we in the church, get caught up in catching someone in sin. These Pharisees are looking at Jesus, watching everything that he does. That's why they knew that his disciples picked up some grain, rubbed it together, and popped it in the mouth, because they were watching not for his teaching, not to learn from him, not to appreciate the things that he was doing, but to accuse him, to accuse his disciples. And at this point, he apparently, Jesus, hadn't done anything that they could accuse him of. So now they're watching. Will he heal on the Sabbath? Will he do this work? On the Sabbath. It's not lawful to do work on the Sabbath, is their mindset. You can't do any work at all on the Sabbath, and if you do, it's sinful. Uh, and that's that, that they're watching him. They're, they're, they're wanting to catch him in the act of sin versus someone being caught in sin. And then listen to Genesis or Galatians 6 1. Brother, if anyone is caught in any trespass, in any sin, you are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of, I got you. Hope. Oh, in the spirit of gentleness. Each looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted to. Practical lesson number one is we need to be more concerned with helping those who are caught in sin instead of worrying about catching them in sin. I hope that's not an issue here. I hope it's not an issue anywhere in the church, but I'm not naive enough to believe that some of us from time to time don't struggle with that. Because we all have egos. We all have uh, pride in our lives sometimes. And we want to mistakenly compare ourselves to other people because when we compare ourselves to God, we always fall a little really short. So we can't say, well, at least I'm as good as God. We can't say that. So sometimes we're tempted to say, well, at least I'm better than person A or person B. That's the attitude I think these Pharisees had. That's the attitude I think Galatians 6 1 is the opposite of. Let's not be so concerned that I'm I won't say that anyone here would, would say, yeah, I struggle with that. I don't, I'm not asking for that. But let's be more concerned about helping those who are caught in sin. Satan has caught some people in sin. In the same way that, that a hunter might go out into the, the woods and lay a trap for an animal, Satan has laid traps at your feet and at my feet, and some of us have been caught in that sin. And we need to be more concerned about helping them out of that sin rather than helping Satan catch them in that sin. Number two, uh, in, in Mark chapter uh, 3, verse, verse 4, Jesus gives them a chance to say and to do the right thing. Notice again, uh, starting with verse 2, they were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with withered hand, get up and come forward. Now that's really going to get your attention because they know he has a withered hand. They're watching him to see if he will heal. Almost makes you wonder, almost makes you wonder that they, that they plant this man with a withered hand. So Jesus wouldn't notice him. So Jesus would be tempted in their minds to heal him. Uh, we, don't, we don't know that. That's, that's pure uh, supposition or, or assumption, but, uh, but perhaps. Uh, in verse 4, and he said to them, he said to those who are watching, he says to the Pharisees and others, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save or to kill? What's their reaction? Well, what's the answer to that? Is it lawful to do good? Yes. Is it lawful to save a life? Yes, that's the answer. We, we recognize that. That's, that's the, uh, again, a practical lesson is doing good is always right. Helping others is always right. But what's their reaction? What's, what's the, what are the religious leaders of the day, what do they do? They keep silent. Now because we know this is their reaction uh, many times with Jesus, because if they agree with him, then the people are going to say, well, the Pharisees agree with him, so we can follow him, we can listen to him. Uh, and they're more concerned about making sure that they continue uh, to be followed. Jesus' actions shows them the answer. What does he do? He heals the man on the Sabbath. He performs that work, if you will, uh, that the work of God you know, that he was able to do. Uh, and the practical lesson number two from this, and again, basic, easy to understand, we all know this, it's always lawful to do good. Now, there are some situations where 
some things might be better to you than other things. Or we have to be mindful. We have to think about what are the, the consequences of these actions. Whether it's uh, whether they, you know in the long run these will be good or not. Yeah, those, those are those things we have to think about. But it's it's always lawful to do good. Elsewhere, Jesus talks about uh, if you're presenting your offering uh, and, and you realize that uh, you, your brother has something against you. This is on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, then what are you supposed to do? Leave the offering. Go be reconciled to your brother and then come back. The Pharisees probably would not have thought that. The Pharisees would have thought, well, if you're in the middle of worship, now let's recognize this in our application for us today. If you're in the middle of worship and it just comes to your mind that your brother has something against you, know you, you finish worshiping first and then you go solve that problem. But Jesus says, no, if you're, the, if you're presenting your offering, if you're right there in the middle of worshiping me and you realize that your brother has something against you, maybe it comes to your mind or you recognize that you stop right then, right there. You go be reconciled to your brother, and then you come back. Now that's certainly how many talk about application. How many times in the church here in Estonia, at Charlotte Avenue, anywhere in any congregation around the world, have brothers and sisters had something against each other and worship God, and never attempted to be reconciled? The, the point Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount about being reconciled to your brother is it, it affects your worship. It stops you from worshiping God in the right way, the way that He has commanded us to worship. So if we have something against our brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to do our part to re be reconciled to them, to do everything we can to fix the issue if we really want our service and our worship to be uh, acceptable in God's eyes. Another, another thing that Jesus talks about uh, where it, you know, He talks about you, you set aside an offering but then your, your mother and your father come to you and, you, and they say that we're in financial need uh, and the, the picture is the child, the adult child at this point says, uh, I really wish I could help you mom and dad but I've already promised this to God. Jesus again makes the point, no, no, you help your family. You help that need. You help those people even if it means you have to take away from what you had promised to me. Again, we're supposed to uh, be purposeful in our giving. We're supposed to give cheerfully. We're not supposed to give last minute. We're not supposed to give out of just what's left over or out of our abundance. We're supposed to, to purpose and plan in our hearts. But what if there was a need that you were aware about and you had the opportunity to give to it, but you said, well, I can't do that because I've only got so much in the bank account left and Sunday's coming and I've got to give on that day. And Jesus says, help me. Do good. And in so doing, we're doing what God would have us to do. Uh, again, the Pharisees probably would, would disagree with what Jesus taught in the next. So, so practical lesson number two, it's always lawful to do good. There, there are complicated issues. There are questions we have to ask. There are things we have to consider. But it is always lawful to do good. Number three, look at Mark chapter 3 and verse 6. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. The Herodians here are those uh, Jewish folks who were working with Herod. They're, they're working with uh, Rome. They're, they're, they're connected um, politically probably uh, uh, to Rome. There's a religious aspect of it, but they're connected politically uh, to Rome and the Roman Empire. Herod is the, uh, the, the governor that the emperor himself put in, put in charge of, of the area of Israel and the surrounding area there, Judea. Um, so I want you to catch that again. Notice Mark, Mark 3.6. This is a significant verse for a lot of reasons, perhaps, but especially for one that I want to mention. Now, they immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might discredit him. Is that what it's it? Is that what it's it? As to how they might uh, make the people not listen to him anymore. As to how they might uh, bring up some doubt in the people's mind. And they're not wanting to just discredit him. You know, you think about politics, right? We all love politics. Don't you love the political season? The best part about the political season, the worst part about the political season, is how everybody talks bad about the other person. Even, even like in the, uh, the uh, a party's primary. But what happens in a party's primary? One Republican or one Democrat talks about one uh, another Republican or another Democrat, whatever party it is, they talk about each other as badly as they absolutely possibly can for months and months and months and months and months and then one of them is chosen, and they're like, oh, I really support this person. They're great. You should vote for them. They, they dog them, and they talk out bad about them. Uh, but then once they're their candidate, they hold them up on a pedestal, right? Well, well Jesus, the, the Pharisees here aren't just wanting to discredit him. 
They're not running political ads about Jesus. It says they want to destroy him. Early on in Jesus' ministry, Mark chapter 3, verse 6, I can think about this until, until this lesson. This is the beginning of the crucifixion. The Jews talking to Romans about destroying Jesus. This is the beginning. It will happen much, much longer away from now. But this is the beginning of the crucifixion of the Jews using the Romans' authority to crucify the Son of God. So part, part number three, uh, point number three, practical lesson number three. Do good even in the face of consequences. We could have uh, a debate, a discussion, classes, uh, quarters long about how much Jesus knew as man and God when he was a child. How much Jesus knew as man and God when he was a teenager. How much Jesus knew as man and God when he was his, in his 20s, even, even in, in, into his 30s. Throughout his whole life, we could, we could have discussions about how much he knew about the, the completion, the fruition, the, the completeness of God's plan. But he knew that he had come to die for mankind so that he could save us from our sins. Did he know in this moment that if I do this, these people are going to turn against me. I believe he, he, he had a pretty good indication. Now, he may not have known that they would begin conspiring by destroying him, but he knew eventually that would happen. And he probably knew that this would be one of those stepping stones that would lead to uh, his eventual death. And in the face of those consequences, he still did good. He still did the right thing. He still helped people. So practical lessons from, from Mark. So we can be uh, on the mark. And when I thought about uh, being on the mark, what's, what's one of those uh, Hebrew definitions for, for sin? Missing the mark. So we want to be on the mark. We don't want to sin. We want to do the right thing. So if you're a Christian, if you've been a Christian before, if you got baptized this morning, if you've been a Christian for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years, for 50 years, here are three practical lessons in Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Help those who are caught in sin. And don't be so concerned about catching them in sin. Now, do we need to be aware? Do we need to be mindful of our brothers and when they're in sin, recognize it? Yes, so that we can help them get out of it. But don't be, don't be concerned about catching people in sin. Be concerned about helping those get out who are caught in sin. Number two, it is always lawful. It's always right to do good. It's not always easy. Sometimes there's a lot of consequences and, and uh, complications. That's what we're looking for. Sometimes it's not the, the easiest thing to do, and there will be things that we'll have to deal with, but it's always lawful. It's always good to do right. It's always right to do good. And number three, do good even when faced with consequences. This is not the, the first example we've seen of doing good in the face of consequences. What did Daniel do when the, the lawman came to the king and said, King, oh, oh wise king, oh, great king, let's, let's make a law that no one can pray to anyone but you. For this certain amount of time, what did Daniel do? He prayed to the God that was real. He didn't submit. He didn't bow down. He didn't close his window. He could have done something as easily and as simple as closing his window. Closing the window, they would have probably never known that he continued to pray to God instead of praying to the king. My probably my favorite story from the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were, it seems, surrounded by a, a crowd of people. On an open plain with a golden statue, 90 feet high and 90 feet or 9 feet wide. And the music played, and there was so much commotion, and it probably would have been pretty easy for them to have simply knelt down, perhaps just for a second, stand back up and walk away. Perhaps that would have been enough for them to, to slide by, or maybe for them to, to bow down and, and stood up and then kept on serving God after that. What did they do? They stood up, they refused to bow down to the golden image. They're given a second chance. And the king says, listen, I'm, I'm angry about this, but I like you. You're good servants of mine, so I'm going to give you another chance. And if you bow down this time, then everything will be okay. So what's their response? Let it be known to you, O king. Our God can and our God will deliver us, but even if he does not, we will not bow down to your golden statue. That was a big temptation. And they didn't bow down. They were thrown into the fire. They were brought through that. Now there are those who, uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, who do the right thing. And they're thrown into the fire metaphorically, and they don't always come through. They give their life for the, for the belief and the cause of Christ. But we need to be willing to, to live our lives and do good, even in the face of difficulty. So 
help those who are caught in sin. Don't be so concerned about catching folks in sin. It's always lawful to do good, not always easy, but always the right thing to do. And do good even when faced with consequences. And if you're a Christian, this is something I've shared recently with the Charlotte Avenue folks and the Infant Brown drinking. But if you're a Christian, I expect you to do the right thing. Why? Because you have said to Jesus, to God, I will follow you. Now, I know that you've said that because you're a Christian. And I have every expectation that when faced with a decision to do the right thing or to do the wrong thing, you will always choose to do the right thing. And you have that expectation of me, not because I'm a preacher, but because I'm a brother in Christ. When someone puts on Christ in baptism, the expectation that God has for them, the expectation that we must have for them, is for them to do the right thing. And when they don't, we help them. We don't cast them aside. We don't get rid of them. We don't ridicule them. We help them. We expect everyone to do the right thing. I know most of us here are not Christians. Many of us have been Christians for many, many years. The question tonight is, are you still doing good? Are you still doing the right thing? Are you still on the mark? Or are you missing the mark? Are you sinning? Are you falling short of the glory of God? Now, all of us have done that in the past, but that doesn't mean that Christians are to continue to do that in the present. Let's make sure that we're doing the right thing. If you're not doing that and you need help, you need our support, you need our prayers, we would love to do that for you tonight. If you're not a Christian and you want to study about that, I would be happy to study with you. I know that many other folks here would be happy to study with you as well. If you have any needs tonight, we invite you to come to this campaign.